Yep, great. I see a few of those. Lovely. Hi. Well, my name's Alex Jacob. I'm going to be chairing uh, the, the meeting this afternoon. And if you're here for the first time, a, a very special welcome to you. Um, most months, we have a special guest speaker who comes and does some teaching with us on a theme related to uh, the ministry of the Church's Ministry of Jewish People. I recognize some of you are very regulars here, which is great. And if you're new, I can say, again, a very special welcome to you. So our speaker this afternoon uh, is, is Paul, Paul Hocking. And if you get the CMJ mail out, the weekly mail out, you will have a trailer of what Paul is going to speak about uh, this afternoon. So if you've seen that, um, you will know that Paul is going to be speaking about um, the book of Leviticus, a new and living way, and looking at the book of Leviticus as part of God's sanctifying journey of his people. Um, and I think also in the trailer, um, you know, Paul was saying there about how often, I think as believers, we, we often find it difficult to engage with the book of Leviticus. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I certainly feel it's very challenging. So I'm very much looking forward to Paul opening up this part of scripture, which in some ways is, is perhaps a closed book or more closed than other books are for us from the 66 books of the Bible. So we're very, very um, much looking forward to this. And I know when Paul spoke last time, um, we were absolutely thrilled with Paul's teaching and we had lots of really encouraging comments, some feedback, lots of questions. So again, I think Paul's going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes. And then if we got time before we close at three o'clock, uh, we might do a bit of Q&A. And of course, if you want to put a question, uh, we have got the chat facility on, on the Zoom. So if you want to put those in, I'll, I'll try and kind of collate those questions. And then if time allows, we can put those to Paul uh, later on before we close at three o'clock. OK, I'm going to pray for Paul and then I'm going to hand over to him. And then uh, the floor is yours, Paul. So we're so pleased you could be with us. Let's Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity you give us to think, to question, to learn, to listen. And we pray, Lord, that you will anoint Paul's words this afternoon. And we thank you for the preparation he has done for this. And we pray, Lord, as he shares, we might uh, be able to hear and respond in a way which honors you. So, Lord, please pour out your spirit on him and all of us who are listening this afternoon. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Paul, over to you. Amen. Thank you. Let me see if I can... Am I sharing the screen or not? Yes, you are. So you can see... Can you see a new and living way? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. Okay, in a, the previous lecture, CMJ lecture I gave, we considered the question, how does God write? As Western moderns, we've learned how to read text as a linear sequence. But we saw following the insights of Moshe Klein, how the Decalogue at least was written on two tablets in five parallel pairs and so should be read in pairs, vertically and horizontally. We also saw that rabbis and scholars have noticed the way the six days of creation in Genesis can be read in the same way as three pairs of days. So the answer to the question, at least for these examples, is God writes on tables, or better, in parallel. It's now recognized that parallelism is a Semitic paradigm and that it should be seen as a, a way of thinking in the Bible and not simply as a way of writing. We may well ask whether this way of writing happens elsewhere in the Bible or at least elsewhere in the Torah. The answer according to Klein, is most definitely yes. He argues that the whole Torah is written in literary units of text, each of which is set out in a table or 
in parallel rows and columns. He suggests the technology of weaving was current at the time and the idea of weaving text may well have been the influence on the Guild of Scribes cost. to write like this. It doesn't cost. Indeed, the use of weaving as a metaphor for writing may well have some evidence in etymology, the root of words. The English word for text, for instance, comes from the Latin textus, referring literally to something woven from textere to weave or to braid. And also the, the Hebrew word maschet, used for tractates of the Mishnah and Talmud, means a web or weaving. So God writes on tables, or better, in parallel, or even better, in a weave. The text is not changed in any way, not even the order of reading. You read it in the same order as you do normally, and you can still meditate on each verse in the same ways you've done up till now. But reading the text in parallel results in additional meaning. You discover there's meaning you could not see before. Sorry, I haven't been concentrating on the PowerPoint. So how does God write? There were the parallel tablets. And here was the, the creation in the parallel that we saw last time. If you want to see these things, it's, it's available in the links that I'll give you at the end. This is the metaphor of weaving, the ancient sort of technology of weaving. Okay, in this paper, we will consider Leviticus as a weave and look at the vertical warp threads first and then the horizontal weft threads, sometimes called the woof. Uh, Leviticus is called Vaikra in uh, Tanakh as this is the first word in the Hebrew uh, of the book. And it means he calls Vaikra. Yahweh calls the reader on a journey into and out of the tabernacle, like moving through a, a textual sanctuary. As you read through the book, you're called to move in your imagination through the outer court and then into the holy place and then into the holy of holies. And you come face to face with the Ark of the Covenant and the revelation of the holy God. From here, you return outwards through the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place and the court to the camp of Israel and the land itself. As you read through the book, you are led to consider the subject matter as you are in these tabernacle zones, as if you're in the tabernacle zones, spiritually speaking, of course. Looking at this composition, you can see the book is made up of eight sections, labeled A to H, for easy reference. There's one section that seems abnormal, which is C, made up of chapters 13 to 15. This section divides the holy place, section B, from the holy of holies, section D. It's made up of material that deals with impurity in Hebrew. Impurity in people and garments and houses and the countermeasures that must be taken, such as isolation and cleansing and even putting outside the camp. Klein suggests this section is removed like the veil being pulled aside. Sorry, Klein suggests this section of the book represents the veil in the tabernacle and as if the, as the subject matter suggests, the section is removed, like the veil being pulled aside, then there's direct access from the, uh, <clears throat> from the holy place 
into the Holy of Holies. Once more, then, the book has a symmetrical, inverted, parallel form. With the three zones of the sanctuary leading to the central arc and the divine presence, followed by the three same three zones in reverse order, like three concentric rings. Assuming this is a correct understanding of section C, the significance is clear. Uncleanness must be removed if the worshipper is to journey into ultimate nearness with Yahweh. This unclean section is a vital part, of course, of the structure and theology of the book, but in order to grasp the underlying basic pattern of the journey in this paper, we'll focus on a simplified structure with the veil drawn aside as depicted here. Looking at this overview and reading the subject matter in each section carefully, the emphasis in the first half is on nearness and this section A centers on the court and deals with what's called korbanim, which is usually translated as offerings but which actually carries the sense of nearness and so could be translated rather literalistically as nearings, as I've done here. God's redeemed people can come near to him if they bring these nearings with them. Then section B deals with those who draw near. The priests becoming and ministering as priests, the ones who bring the nearings. This is the stage in the book that Moses and the high priest Aaron enter the sanctuary or holy place for the first time after bringing the nearings. Then drawing aside the veil, C, as we've said, the reader enters the fourth section, D, literally walking into the Holy of Holies with the high priest on the day of atonement. Entering the throne room of God in the reading, one could not be nearer. Inside the holy place, the reader takes one final step, section E, and stands before the Ark of the Covenant, containing the two tablets with the Decalogue inscribed on them and hearing the voice of the Lord saying, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Sixteen times in this section, the divine voice says, I am Yahweh, or the longer form, I am Yahweh your God. God's call to holy behavior is based solely on the fact that his redeemed people now belong to him, and he is committed to them. Be holy because I am the Lord your God and because I am holy. This divine self-revelation and the call to his holiness then dictates the emphasis of the second half of the book. With God's people called to, to live out his holiness beyond the sanctuary, living as a holy nation in the realities of the world. So the first half of the book calls every redeemed individual to nearness, going into the Lord as a kingdom of priests. And the second half calls the community to holiness, living out as the Lord's holy nation. Scholars such as Rabbi August Klausterman in 1893 have rightly recognized the shift in the second half of the book to what is called the holiness code or amongst Hebrew speaking scholars, the holiness book. But there had been the same, but, but there's not been the same recognition of the key literary term in the inward phase of the journey, that of nearness. It would indeed be right to label the first half of the book, the nearness code paralleling the holiness code 
in the second half. So, in summary, Leviticus sets out a sanctuary journey in two phases, individually moving inwards to nearness, becoming a kingdom of priests, and as a result of seeing the divine self-revelation at the Ark in the Holy of Holies, then turning outwards in holiness as a community to live as a holy nation in the world. If the big picture of Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers is salvation, that's bringing out the people from Egypt and bringing them in to the promised land, then the nested picture in Leviticus, which is central in the journey, is the theme of sanctification, going in to nearness in the sanctuary and going out in holiness to the land. Leviticus sets out God's means of transformation, the process by which he transforms the slaves of Egypt into saints fit for the land, in spirit now, of course, for the reader and worshipper. Going in and going out. However, this is just the one perspective, the vertical threads. What about the colourful details given by the weave, by the horizontal weft threads? Klein shows each of the seven sections of the book is made of three literary units, not including the central unit E, the arc, which acts like a single unit hinge in the book. I'll stop for a moment for you to get your head around this. We've still got the vertical threads, the court, the holy place, the holy of holies and so on. But now each section is actually made up of three mini sections or units. Unit one, two and three are in section A. Klein shows each of the, sorry, the seven unit triads make up 21 literary units plus the central unit, so 22 units in all. The units are labeled with Roman numerals in the book weave here, and the italic numerals show the chapter references. Again, reading carefully, one discovers these unit triads are oriented with an above unit, a below unit, and a between unit. The above unit is always God oriented, shown in blue, and the below unit is always earth or mundane or people oriented, shown in green, and the between unit always shows the connection or relationship between the above and the below, between God and his people. Shown in turquoise here. There are three features of this pattern that need to be noticed. Firstly, as previously mentioned, the unclean section C is omitted to show the simplified underlying composition with the veil removed. Secondly, the unit triads in the second half of the book are inverted. Can you see in the second half, the top one is unit 16 and the bottom one is unit 14 and so on. So they're inverted units. It's based on their content and literary indicators as they appear to be arranged in inverted parallelism with the first half of the book. This is a further indication of the turnaround expected of the reader when needing to show the orientation of each unit in the composition, Klein inverts the units in the second half as here, so that the God 
or sacred oriented units are on the top and the people or mundane oriented units are all on the bottom row. The three concentric rings are not only projected onto a, saban, a tabernacle zone, the court, the holy place, the holy of holies, but also have three organizing principles as you can see in the bottom row. So there's the place is the principle of the outer ring and time, the principle of the middle ring and an emphasis on person in the inner ring. With the focus of all three rings being, of course, unit 13, which is chapter 19, which is the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Of course, there's much to be examined and discussed in the details of each section. And I would really encourage you to gather a small group together and study each unit together. But for now, let's briefly consider the units in section A, the unit triad A, as an example. Unit one is oriented upwards towards God. And if you read it, it's three chapters containing the details for the voluntary or pleasing aroma offerings that individuals can bring in their approach to God at the altar in the court. These are nothing to do with sin specifically. They're all about worship for God. Indeed, the very first offering, often called in English the burnt or offering or the whole offering in chapter one, is actually called in Hebrew, olah, which literally means that which goes up or ascends. It should really be called the upward offering or the upward nearing, as it's all burnt up to God in keeping with the Godward orientation of this unit. Then taking the opposite pole, which is unit three, it's below oriented, containing a series of mundane regulations for the priests regarding the offering procedures and the portions to be used for their everyday maintenance. And then thirdly, the middle unit, unit two, contains the sin and trespass offerings or nearings, which address what individuals must do when there has been some kind of unintentional break in relationship between the above and the below, with God and with others, providing a way for those who sin to restore their relationship with God and with others. So 10 times in this unit, the root atone occurs, and nine times the root forgive occurs. So all seven sections have a similar orientation for their three literary units. And it's a fulfilling experience to study each unit from the perspective of where it sits in the warp and woof of the book's weave. A famous theologian called Milgram has said, structure is theology. And you can see what he means when you look at this weave of Leviticus. But let's move to another perspective. We've seen the book of Leviticus is projected onto the three zones of the wilderness tabernacle, like a journey into and out of a textual sanctuary. The literary artist has projected a world, the ancient tabernacle, in the text of Leviticus. The book is not simply made up of two themes, such as ritual and ethical, or cult and community, as some scholars say, but as we've seen, the composition is following a journey inwards through the three zones of the sanctuary into the Holy of Holies and hinging at unit 13, the Ark of the Covenant and then taking a return journey back out through the same three zones. So Leviticus acts like a text world or a memory palace was 
an old Roman term for the worshipper and reader and listener as they walk through the zones of the sanctuary. Turning from the literary book to the physical sanctuary, its other name is the tent of meeting and it gives the sense of both space and time. Space is the tent, meeting is the time, the when and the where in which the Lord calls his people to come near to him. And using modern language, this could be conceived of as a, a space-time capsule in which God transforms his people from slaves in Egypt into a holy nation fit for the land. To visualize how that literature is being projected onto this sanctuary, the reader needs to have in mind a simplified plan of the tabernacle, like here. As we've seen in this appointment tent, there are three zones or spheres of consideration, the court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, an outer, a middle, and an inner zone or sphere. The book of Leviticus has been projected onto these three spheres. And throughout the book, in the concentric rings of unit triads, there's way markers to indicate to the reader the sphere of influence being considered. The unit triads are not to be read locationally as if all were taking place within that zone of the tabernacle, but thematically in the text world. And given this, I've labeled each zone a theme sphere. to indicate that all the material in the unit triad is influenced by that sphere's theme or theological perspective. The first half of the book, which represents the inward journey, could be represented graphically as here. And in that half of the book, the purpose of the journey seems well described by the Lord when Israel came to the Mount of Sinai he, there he told them if, that if they kept his covenant, that they could become, they would become for him a kingdom of priests. And this half of the transforming journey sets out the process for the readers to become such a kingdom of priests. Now I recognize a complex composition like Leviticus can't easily be boiled down <laughs> to sound bites but I've attempted to summarize the key concepts in a graphic format using the repeating word nearness in each zone. So first of all, zone A, which is the unit triad A, calls every individual in the congregation and of course the reader to draw near to the Lord through the door into the court of the tabernacle to stand in front of the large altar that dominates the perspective. As worshippers drawing near, they are commanded to bring near their korbanim. Nearness to the Lord is possible for the ordinary Israelite in this world, but only through the nearings that God has prescribed. From the perspective of the inner movement of this part of the book, the root idea of nearness is explicit. Many readers and interpreters have missed this emphasis, reading the text as if addressing primitive worshippers, bringing gifts to please some God, rather than focused on the Lord and his call to his people to nearness. The whole unit triad is located in the tabernacle court, and presents the Lord as dictating the way by which his people are to come near to him by means of the korbanim that he describes. The second unit triad, B, is headed by the initiation and ministry of the, of the priests, who are actually called here those who are near me, or those who come near 
to me. And it's in this unit triad, the text tells us that Moses and Aaron enter for the first time into the sanctuary, tent itself, into the first chamber, the holy place. This completes a narrative arc from Exodus 40, where we're told Moses was not able to enter the sanctuary because of the glory of the Lord had come right through now to Exodus 9, where we read of Moses and Aaron entering for the first time on the basis of the nearings and the glory of the Lord appears again and consumes the nearings. As explained above, the third unit triad can be considered as a representation of the veil. The Lord sees uncleanness as a barrier one that must be removed if the reader worshipper is to enter into the holy place. The fourth unit triad, D, is the inner sphere, is headed by the day, day of atonement unit, unit 10. And this is where for the first time the high priest and of course the reader is able to enter in to the innermost sphere of the sanctuary, the holy of holies. It's as if the readers are all priestly worshippers, journeying with the high priest on the Day of Atonement, passing through the court and the holy place right into the Holy of Holies. Leviticus is not an exclusive manual for priests, but a call to all God's people to join in the sanctifying journey in the hearing or reading. At each stage, it's made clear that nearness is dependent on acting with the specified nearings, the korbanim. And as the scene in the B triad with Nadab and Abihu demonstrates, to act otherwise means it's not the Ola nearing that's consumed in the acceptance, but those who dare to come near inappropriately are consumed in judgment. Virtually all composition proposals for Leviticus see chapter 16 as the center of the book. Most also agree that this chapter is then followed by another source called the Holiness Code, making up the second half of the book, they say from chapter 17 to 27. However, Klein is unique in arguing there's another way to view the center in keeping with the literary indicators. He argues the central concentric circle, which is 16 to 18 parallel with 20 to 22, certainly occurs in the theme sphere of the Holy of Holies. So it's definitely at the center of the book conceptually. And indeed, chapter 16 is the first unit that takes the reader into the Holy of Holies. But the key insight here is that chapter 19 takes another step inwards to section E, which is uh, the chapter uh, unit 13, which is enclosed within the Holy of Holies and um, constitutes the Ark of the Covenant. So really, in this model, the Ark of the Covenant is like the center of the center of the Book of Leviticus. The unit chapter is dominated by mentions of, the most, of most of the Decalogue and 16 mentions of the divine self-revelation. I am the Lord your God in keeping with the context here of the Ark of the Covenant containing the Decalogue tablets. Again, Klein has shown the material in this unit 13 is also structured in two dimensional parallel or woven form with the one dimension or column or tablet focusing on the commandments for individuals and the other dimension or column or tablets focusing on the commandments uh, for the community. It therefore appears that the composition of the central unit 
is like a hinge in the journey between the inward individual journey and the outward community oriented journey. This inward journey to the innermost sphere of the sanctuary is a journey into relationship with the divine. So the central unit is headed with the command of the Lord, translated word for word, holy you shall be, for holy am I, the Lord your God. And its inverted parallel in the two tablet structure is the command and love your neighbor as yourself. This call to holiness in relation to God and to love in relation to people is the essence of this chapter or unit being transformed into the likeness of God, the imitatio dei, and then living out in the light of that as a holy nation in love for others. It's then completely logical for the holiness code to be laid out from this point in the book. It also makes sense of the fact that there's no references to holiness in chapter 17 and 18, the previous two units, which is a serious challenge to those who argue the holiness code runs from chapter 17. The proportion of the root word for holy in chapters 19 to 27 is 2.3 times the proportion in chapters 1 to 18. From this point on, the journey reverses, moving back out of the sanctuary through the Holy of Holies to the holy place and finally to the court and land. This is indicated in a literary sense by the remaining units being an inverted parallel, not just in the contents generally, but also their literary indicators. The unit triads are inverted in their vertical orientation as if to confirm the about face for the reader. In the second part of the book, the journey, the movement is outwardly focused, as we said, and I've labeled it as living out as it sets out the sanctified people and now to live as a witnessing congregation, the Adar, a witness to the world, to God's sanctifying work. This second phase fits with the second descriptor for God's people in Exodus 19, verse 6, not just to be a kingdom of priests, but also now a holy nation. Again, we'll take the unit triads in order, this time journeying outwards. The fifth unit triad F is parallel, you can see, with the fourth D, still conceptually in the theme sphere of the Holy of Holies, but oriented outwards, living out as a holy priestly nation. Appropriately, it's focused on the priesthood, as if we're all priests now but not as going in to the Holy of Holies, but as living out in the world as a priesthood set apart for God. The sixth unit triad, G, parallels the second, which is B, in the theme sphere of the holy place. And it makes this obvious with the legislation in the above unit, 19, dealing with the continual daily and weekly priestly service at the lampstand and the table, both of which stand in the holy place. This emphasis on time in G is very strong in the between unit, unit 18, about the weekly Sabbath and the annual appointed times, Moedim, setting out the rhythms that confirm and affirm and maintain and manifest the community of God as a holy nation. The strong impression is given that the Sabbath as a principle is the rhythm and goal of such a holy nation, ensuring the holy people are ongoingly connected in relationship with the Lord their God, as if living in the holy place as they live out in the real world. 
As in the opening unit of the second unit triad, unit four, so now in the parallel closing unit of the sixth uh, unit triad, G, there's a unique narrative embedded in this part of the book. It's strange that this should occur because the whole book is a, a book of laws and yet there's these two narratives and I'm going to skip this bit in the paper, you can read about the details afterwards, but in section B in the going in, there's the narrative about Nadab and Abihu, about a, a strange entry. And then in this section in G, there's another narrative about uh, a, a stranger, a, a man of mixed race, Israelite and Egyptian, and blaspheming the name. And as if these two narratives are indicating the entry and the exit, into the sanctuary as far as the book's concerned. So finally, the seventh unit triad, H, parallels the first unit, A. The individuals that began the journey of nearing in the first unit triad and of becoming like a kingdom of priests have now been sanctified by the Holy One and so are enlightened to live out as a holy nation as a testimony in the freedom and shalom of the land, as God had promised, and with the Lord walking among them as he did in Eden. In this unit triad, the focus is on the community, living out the good of being a holy nation and walking in keeping with a covenant with the Lord. They are living as free citizens in the land and everything is lived as to the Lord and according to values that are governed by the sanctuary. So in conclusion, to apply the words of Hebrews 10, 19 to 25, this new and living way of reading the book of Leviticus seems to show indeed that the author had in mind a new and living way of conceiving the sanctuary and the priesthood and the nation and how readers and worshippers could continue to go in and out of the textual sanctuary and become sanctified in the journey even long after the tabernacle sanctuary had ceased to exist. Thank you. We will finish there and come out of, well, I'll come out of stop screen for a moment, but I'll bring the main slides up in, in, when we start talking. Well, thank you so much, Paul. It, it kind of raises lots of questions and, and lots of insights. So, so thank you, thank you so much. And it kind of also brought back to mind what you spoke about last time. I kind of saw the connection between between yes. both your presentations. That, that was really, really good. I'm just looking on the chat to see if there's any specific questions. So if, if, you, if you have a specific question, um, if you'd like to put it on the chat, that'd be really, really helpful. Um, um, so I'll just give people a couple of minutes to see if there's any specific questions. Um, just waiting for people there. Um, if I if I share the screen, the main two slides, um, it, it'll help maybe prompt thoughts. Uh, but can you see the chat if I do this, Alex? Yes, I think I can. Yes, I think I can, Paul. Yes, I can. Isn't yeah. technology marvelous? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, if I if I show you these oh, these two slides. This is the one slide which shows you the book as a weave. And then this is the other slide which shows you it as a journey. But they both say the same thing, but just looking at it from two different perspectives. So, um, you know, if, if you want to talk about anything specifically um, around these, then I, I can use these for my response. Okay, Paul, I have a general question just to kind of kick us off. So, 
just 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 remind us how you got into this kind of research and you, you're referring to a couple of these important rabbis so how did how did your study or how did your interest because obviously you're going to this at a much deeper level than, than most of us i just wondered if you want to say a little bit about how how your journey into these insights started really yes I've, I've always loyed, uh, enjoyed looking at books as a whole. You know, um, I was influenced as a younger man, and I still am, by a guy called Professor David Gooding and uh, Professor John Lennox. You might know these people. But these, these sort of showed me the amazing way of looking at books as a whole and for the way they're very often set out in a structured form that we don't tend to see as ordinary English readers and particularly because the chapters are very often in the wrong place. Um, and so I got into that, but later on in life, I was asked to teach in a Bible school in Serbia, and um, it was a seminary, one year program going through the Bible for young Christians. And they asked me randomly to teach the books of Joshua and the book of Leviticus. And I think I got the short straw because, uh, you know, I, I was given these two books every year to teach. And I taught them for 14 years, uh, went out for two weeks, taught jo jo uh, Leviticus one week and Joshua the next. And teaching the book of Leviticus 14 times through really gave me an amazing conviction about it, about the way God intends it to be this sanctifying process for his priestly people. And for the way Christians usually, uh, you know, tend to, we have no idea what it's about. And, and we've stopped reading it and we, we've lost touch with it. And yet it's intended to lead us to, to holiness. You know, it, it is, it is the, uh, the book for worshippers, for God's people. And, and so people encouraged me to write a book on this. So I, I started to write, but in the process, I came across a guy online called Moshe Klein. And I couldn't believe the way he had stumbled across, you know, before me, uh, the, the key themes that I was noticing. And I got hold of him and he he's a, a devout Orthodox Jew, uh, American educated, but now living in Israel, in Jerusalem and has done for 20 years now or so. And uh, he invited me to start studying with him. And we started studying by Skype the book of Leviticus, unit by unit. So I went through all 22 units with him. And then we started with Genesis, then Exodus. I've been through all 86 units of the Torah with him, and they're available for you online for free on his website. And uh, we've studied every single one over 13 years, uh, meeting most Thursdays for an hour and just studying through. And it's been a delight and a pleasure to me, clearly, uh, to do this. But it's convinced me of this insight that he's had into the Torah as, as tables, you know, it as the Decalogue. So the Decalogue is the paradigm that we're meant to see. And indeed, Genesis 1, the creation, is set in the same paradigm. And we're meant to see this way of seeing and then read the rest of the Torah in the same way. And so he set the whole Torah out with this map and it's available for free on, on his website. But this is, these are the units for, for Leviticus. So, um, yeah. So, so uh, Heather asked a question and it was just a point of information really, where she talked about, um, she, she understands that you use the word parallel or parallelism in the first part. And there's another word you used beginning with the letter P, which you couldn't, can record given that might be the word paradigm you were referring to there as well yes it probably it was beginning with p it was the word paradigm right. and a paradigm is a idea you know world view right and yes. our world view is to read books as linear texts you know yes. so they're on a page going down paragraph after paragraph yes but we and don't notice the way they're meant to be set in parallel you know the paragraphs are meant to be side by side and yes. we don't notice that. And, and the, the markers for it are shown us in the text. So we have to learn to read those markers. And I suppose this leads on to the point which one of my colleagues, Timothy Button's made here. But this is a tremendous challenge. I mean, if this is true, Paul, and we're saying it is, we understand this, <laughs> but this is a tremendous challenge to the evangelical habit of, of kind of chopping up the text into little bits 
Yes. And then trying to trying to, I suppose, um, teach from those bits with no reference to the whole. I mean, yes. I'm, I, but, but I suppose in a sense that 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 is a Jewish tradition, though, isn't it, of having you know lectionary set readings and stuff. But you, but yes. But how, how would you respond to that, Charlie? I mean, when when you're preaching or teaching. It's quite yeah. hard to do this overview work, but obviously you're saying it's, it's essential to help us understand the meaning. Yes, I, I would say th this isn't the only way of reading the Bible. You know, the, all the ways we've ever read the Bible are all right and good, aren't they? So, so this isn't saying there's, you know, read the Bible any way that, you know, the Lord leads you. Uh, but but, this but do is, you think some ways are better than others? <laughs> that way, then. Uh, well, what I'm saying is this is a way that I think is, God has revealed it in a new way in this generation. Um, and God is awakening us to see this way of reading. And I believe it's showing us the two voices that God is speaking in. The Lord spoke to Moses in a vision in the mountain, you know, in heaven by revelation. And then Moses came down and taught the people on earth in a human voice. There's two voices in the Bible. And we could, you know, if you're like using the Greek terms, one is logos and one is rhema. You know, one is one is text, if you like, and the other is spirit. And, and these these are the two voices. You can read the text in a linear way. But if you read it in a parallel way, you will hear the other voice, the, the revelation voice. And it's it's most insightful. And of course, it. Can you see now, I hope I've at least convinced you that, you know, the dead book of Leviticus that everybody talks about blood and sacrifices is, is inspiring theology about how we can be spiritual people. We need to go near to God, you know, and there's these three stages and, and then we need to live out in the world. So being sanctified is a two-sided process. Very good. Brilliant. That's that's uh, uh, that's really re really help, 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 helpful to us. Um, just, to, just to answer Tim's specific point, I am a preacher and teacher. I in my own local chapel. It's a country, you know, community, a little chapel in in the country in Wales, and I I've taught through Leviticus. We did twenty two sermons on Leviticus, and all in bite sized chunks, but all based on this frame. So the church members slowly, bit by bit, came to see a bigger picture for Leviticus. Um, so it can be done. And I'm currently teaching a series of eight on nature's parables in Genesis 1, which is the whole of unit one, but I'm teaching it specifically sermon by sermon. Excellent. Well, I'm sure that's a rich, a rich feast for, for, <laughs> for the congregation, congregation there. Jean has asked if we could have uh, the website link to um, to yes. Mushy Klein, Klein's uh, website. I, I'm not sure if that's possible, yes. but that would yeah. be really yes. helpful, I'm sure, for, for some of us to, to, to follow that up. Yeah, my paper's got all the references and links in, and but it's chaver.com, chaver, which is C-H-A-V-E-R, and it means um, friend, you know, um, it's a sort of used of scholars studying together, chaverim. Um, but it means brotherly friend or you know stu fellow student, Haver. And on his website is the whole structured Torah. You can download it for free in English and in Hebrew, of course. And um, there's all his papers that he's written, both the published ones and the, the non-published ones. So there's a lot to read there, but much of it is you know difficult and heavy and, and one of the reasons i i feel this you know trying to explain it in simple ways to christians so that they can see it makes sense can i okay i've just got a final question for me and if anybody else has a question it's, it's, it's like a wedding service you've got to ask now or be forever silent in, on, on the chat so so i suppose for us as, as believers in jesus we see how this in a sense this this process of sanctification and coming close and you know this whole process of God's cleansing and forgiveness uh, and going out in the world it's, it's it's kind of we understand that in in our encounter with with the Messiah that we are we are sanctified in him and, and through his spirit and we're sent out to, to serve him so in a sense for us we would see that whole temple or tabernacle being 
being fulfilled um, in the personal work of Jesus. So in a sense, the loss of the temple for the early messianic community was not a spiritual loss in one sense because Jesus is the temple. We and we are the temple of the spirit. And I understand perhaps as a biblical Jew in the time of Leviticus or whatever, understanding this in terms of what will happen in the temple. But for your Orthodox Jewish friend, how does he then understand this process of sanctification where Jesus is not the Messiah and there is no temple and there's no priesthood? I mean, what, how, how does this then give any kind of life or, or spiritual depth to his, his journey? Yes, well, clearly he spends his life studying the Torah in detail at this kind of level. So he obviously believes there's um, work in it, but the blessing in it. But as, as you know, for a Jewish believer to study is, is the blessing, to actually right. spend time in Torah, God blesses you. And that um, if you study, say, the offerings, it's equivalent to making the offerings. Right. In, in their view, in the rabbinic view, the rabbis actually taught to this. Because, of course, rabbis were teaching beyond 200 AD. The Mishnah and so on was written after 200 AD. And all their writings were based on Torah. And they were saying, this Torah is not out of date. It's not irrelevant because it's talking about offerings or tabernacle or temple. It's very relevant in, in the study because that's what transforms you by studying Torah. Now, this is, this is true for Christians. By studying the scriptures, we are sanctified. You know, we are blessed in the study. But of course, we do believe, and I, I've written this paper in a way that is suitable for, for Jews and for Christians. So I have clearly hinted, you know, in my reference to Hebrews, that, that I believe Jesus has fulfilled all this. Yes. But you can read this paper and you can read this Leviticus like this and, and be blessed by it as a Jew. Yes. But in a that's, similar, that's really, no, really simple really way, helpful. Great way, you could be blessed, you know, as you read it as a Christian, because all the five offerings, they're all Christ. Yes. And the yes. high priest is Christ. And the day of atonement is Christ. You know, so, so it, it's all revealing Christ in his fullness, I believe. And that, that's why I'm calling it a new and living way. I mean, my Hebrews called it a new and living yeah, way. Absolutely. I've got two final questions and then we're going to close it. So, Paul, thank you so much for engaging with us so well. We have over 36 devices at one point today. So that's great. So that may well be 40 or more people. So thank you so much for sharing with us. There's a practical question here, I suppose, from, from one of our listeners, that you describe the Sabbath as being absolutely found fundamental to, to Israelites, living, living it out, if you like. Yes. How, how do you see, you know, as, as believers in Jesus, that, that importance, that, that rhythm of the week or, or the significance of the Sabbath for you, Paul, or, or for your congregation? Yes, yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, in the same sense that I see the offerings, it, it, you see, we don't do the offerings today, but we we believe in the meaning, the significance of the offering, yes. all their spiritual truth. Same with Sabbath. We don't necessarily, well, we don't keep Sabbath in the Jewish sense. I personally don't. But I believe in Sabbath, both from creation, so it applies to all of us, not just the Jews. Uh, the principle of Sabbath in our lives is fundamental to us as human beings, as created people. Uh, but the spiritual truth of Sabbath, which is brought out majorly in Unit 18, because all the, all the festivals are all about Sabbath. And that's why it starts with Sabbath, which is the weekly thing, and then the rest of the uh, festivals are laid out. They're all Sabbath. They're all themed Sabbath. And God, God is saying you need a spiritual rhythm in your life. And that's what Sabbath is about. And I believe this, this picture, this diagram here, is showing you the rhythm. God is saying, I want you to go in to nearness regularly and consistently, daily and weekly, monthly and yearly. Build this rhythm into your life. 
and go out into the world blessing it that's the rhythm and it's sabbath really so i don't know if that's the answer but uh, no that's brilliant uh, and okay and one final question which is a very unfair question really but it's often the kind of question which has been kind of um uh, rattling around in, in, in kind of theological debate, this whole process of sanctification, which you're saying is this, this what, what the book is about in a way. I, I mean, how, how sanctified can we be as believers? I mean, Wesley always talked about that. He believed that someone could be fully sanctified, yes, but yeah. he never met anyone like that. I mean, we all, <laughs> and, and sometimes the more we grow as Christians, the more we are aware of our lack of sanctification and so we're more aware of our own fallenness. So how do you see this? I mean, is that a goal which is achievable or, or is it simply beyond, beyond this, this life? How, how do you see sanctification? What, what encouragement or, or kind of guidance would we give to a new believer who's seeking this, this holiness in the Lord? Yes, well, certainly as a, as a regularly falling person, I can't sort of side with Wesley, of course, on, on his view specifically on this, but in principle, and Wesley and the Methodist movement set out exactly this pattern. Yes. Th this right. is the Methodist movement laid right. out in front of you. And, uh, and I believe this is the answer. Do you go into the tabernacle once and that's it? Well, well clearly you don't. God put the tabernacle in the midst of the nation and said, whenever you come, do this. Yes. Th this is the invite. The, the, the book is called Vaikra. You know, he's calling. He's calling from within the tabernacle to all God's people to come and come near to him. And you do this regularly, daily, weekly. You know, you build this into your life. That's what God put the tabernacle there in the midst of the people for. A number of people we ask about your papers and my colleague John says we're going to put all the links and all the details on the website. So if you want to follow this up some more, just visit our website and we can we, we can download it from the from the website. So that should be really helpful. Paul, once again, you know, I, I, my mind is buzzing and I, I'd love to meet you face to face. and We'll have another chat sometime. But thank you for giving time to us this afternoon. I, I think we've been in. We've had a real treat of, of, of getting ourselves to think and, and, and wrestle with this such an important text. So may the Lord bless you and thanks everybody for coming. Um, we are meeting again um, on the uh, 8th of September for another uh, lecture. And again, details will be sent out in plenty of time for that. But you could like to mark the date, 8th of September, uh, and again, two o'clock. So Paul, we're going to uh, give you a virtual round of applause from here. In, in Zoom land. So thank you so much for coming and uh, thank you everybody. Uh, again, if you want to pray tonight for the work of CMJ, particularly, uh, we have a guest from Shoresh in Israel. Uh, the Shoresh director will be speaking to us. And again, there's a Zoom prayer meeting tonight, which begins at half past six. So if you have time to do both, you'll be doubly blessed both by listening to Paul this afternoon and by the Zoom uh, prayer meeting this evening at half past six. So thank you everybody for engaging with us. I wish you a very, very good afternoon. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.